as people are joining in, we'll welcome you again. It's, it's good to have you with us. Uh, while we're, we're waiting to get started, you might uh, think about questions you'll have. There will be time uh, after our conversation to have some questions from any one of you. Um, and I'll just uh, show the book on the screen so we have some, some placement. Uh, you can order a copy if you haven't yet uh, from Coffee House Press. That's uh, coffeehousepress.org. Uh, it's just a fantastic book. We'll be talking a bit more about it pretty soon. Uh, I see we have a, 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 a core group of attendees who've joined us. So maybe Carmen, if, if you don't mind, let's begin. Of course. Welcome. Uh, let me give you a quick introduction. Uh, this is, uh, well, introduce myself first, I suppose. I'm Joseph Ugaretz. I'm Macaulay's Chief Academic Officer. And I'm really happy to be here today in, in conversation with our distinguished lecturer, Carmen Buyosa. Um, Carmen is, is the author of 18 novels, if, I'm, if I haven't lost count. My 19 is about to appear. Well, that... feels like so many things have, have awaited a very moment, but now the publisher needs to go back to moving. They need to. And uh, it's coming out on September 8th. It's going to be the 19th. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. Eight, 18 going on 19 novels and 15 collections of poetry and four plays, two collections of short stories and one screenplay and, and more all the time. Uh, Carmen was awarded the Rosalia de Castro Award by Penn Galicia in 2018. Uh, ma many other awards, the Café Gijón Award in 2008 excuse my pronunciation. Um, she's been named one of Mexico's top uh, 100 uh, innovators and creators. Um, she has a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. She's taught at San Diego State, at Georgetown, at Sorbonne, at NYU, at Columbia, at, at CUNY Zone City College, and best of all, uh, at Macaulay Honors College, which is, is why we're happy to, to welcome you here today, Carmen. Uh, I, I'd like to begin, I think, by talking a little bit about, about your life and, and your process as a writer. Uh, I think that's something people will be interested to hear about. When did you first start writing? Um, I come from a family where there was nothing like a writer, nothing similar to a writer. My parents both had uh, been at college and studied. They were both... Uh, chemists. It was the career of the future then. And my father was um, an avid reader. So I grew up, in fact, surrounded by books. And when I was a little kid, my father, when he arrived from work, his duty with the daughters, we were the first three daughters, girls, was to put us to sleep. And in reality, what he wanted to do was to read. So he opened whichever book he was reading and he read aloud for us. And that way, and he read, but in a way very respectfully because I, I was a kid, I must have been seven years old and he read us the whole Quixote, the Quixote. Or he read uh, El Buscón de Quevedo, a lot of classics, Spanish classics, Mexican classics, he loved poetry and he read for us in the night. My two sisters, uh, I, I was the, the one in between, my older and my younger sister, they fell asleep immediately. He started reading and for them, it was like the perfect way to put them to sleep. But I learned two things with him. I learned certain proximity with him that had something sometimes frightening and I learned how to be an insomniac. I was unable to go to sleep while he was reading aloud. And he kind of forgot he was reading for us. And he kept till the end of the chapter or wherever it was a pause. He looked around. I was still there like this. He said, put yourself to sleep. And he left. And I remember every day was like the same ritual. He came out of the bedroom. My mother said, are they asleep? And he said, yes, 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 don't worry. And I was still awake. And I was thinking or not thinking. And this 
strange sense that gave me, and I then, it, it, I started being a reader on my own, first the little books of children. Very soon, I was also, like my father, an avid reader. So I, I, there are photographs of the family, and all the, my brothers and sisters were playing or laughing or whatever it is, and I'm right there with a book. In, in, reading in front of and with my book in my legs, like my father. Because I remember even before remembering him reading us aloud, his jacket was always a little bit off because he sneaked in books. And he did crimes like if the book was too wide, he cut the book in two and put half of it on his work suit. And his suits, I, I remember seeing the suits of all men, they were like, similar the jackets my father always had this mm -hmm. curve of a reader and an and avid reader if he had a minute he wanted to read so uh, that part i'm very grateful to him because he opened me the door of a reader that's a fantastic thing but i would have never thought i could be a writer um, when my mother died when I was about to be 15 years old. I was still a little kid. It was, we're talking of 69, so girls took more time to grow. Um, my father couldn't manage his silly. The situation it was very difficult for him. We were six children. The smallest was two years old. Everything became very difficult in the house. And my way out was to say, I am a writer. And I started writing like little process, semi poems, things. And I thought I was like, I belonged to that world that had given me, if not a certainty, because I think that the reader doesn't have a certain solid world, but does have a world of its own. So I started being more so of my own world. My family had all gone into, it was a very difficult moment. And um, my body, I sprouted, I grew, it was like shorter, I became a woman. And my city changed a lot. Mexico City, the subway opened in 68. And that changed totally like the, like the feeling of the city and the feeling of the crowd. Before that, the mayor we, what we had had for many years, all my childhood, he was a major, I think, 12 years, Uruchurto. He had only one, one uh, you, 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 Uruchurto was his name. And he didn't let like the feeling of the city, he was very classist, very, um, he was a, a piece of work. He closed many, had, like city had many barriers. So you never saw the people in the places I went to, in the beautiful avenues covered by flowers and the fountains and the rest. It was like it had a makeup of still the city in which I was born. I was born when the city had three million and a half. Mm. Then, well, now it has 22 million people. And, when I, I grew up and the city also made these changes. And the only thing I had that was for me mine, because my body, I had to again reconquer my, my being a, an adult body. The family thing was so difficult and different. The city was so different. And I had, I had, a, I thought I had a profession. It was an invention because it was not, not something I knew how to do. I don't know where I caught it because there was no writer among us. It was the books. I wanted to be in that world. Um, and, and it gave me, it has given me a beautiful life. It made me have a life in so many ways. And it's like in my marrow. It's something very peculiar. It's, it's, I know it's my profession, but I know it's a way of being. It's the way I, it's the way I am. It's the way I look at things. Uh, I, I can't, I can't be without my notebook aside. I'm still a 19th century person. I use my pen. I use my notebooks, uh, and and I have that. It's something for me very important. 
or important is a stupid word, word to describe. What's been my profession for me? Hmm. We've talked before about uh, the influence of, of the atmosphere in Mexico City when you were a, a young writer and how uh, inspiring and, and, uh, and how much that built your ambition. Do you still see that uh, atmosphere in Mexico City? And, and are there other places in the world that work like that? I think all cities have their moments. New York is one of those that has had very um, mo moments, very generals for to be writers or for writers. Um, and I had this moment in Mexico. I don't know particularly what it was, but it was all teenagers when I could be away in the city. Uh, and I started entering the city and I went to enter the university, all that. And then suddenly I was not the only writer. All the, all the teens and post-teens around me, they all wanted to be writers. Or that was my feeling, obviously not, but they were the ones that were with me at the bookstores, the cafes, the places we gathered. Roberto Bolaño describes it beautifully in his novel, The Savage Detectives. He's my, he was my generation. We were in the same, though different teams, but we were in the same world, this world of writers. And I think uh, all cities have moments like that. Now, also, it's unfair to say cities. I think of the national poet of Mexico, the one that wrote the poem we all learned by heart because it's uh, Lopez Velarde, he's a great poet. And he grew up in a little town. And I think of Emily Dickinson. We cannot say that she made herself a poet uh, because the city, she was able to make, even when she was encapsulated at home, to make a, 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 a world of, by writing to those who published books and who those who did and connecting through the books. And she knew she was in the century of Walt Whitman. She knew Elizabeth Barrett was there, she knew. So the sense of that uh, literature not being only a thing of the past because it's always a thing that gives us the past, we can munch into the past, but it also um, gives a sense of present and a sense of belonging. So city is a bit of fair, of fair. Not, you don't need a city, maybe you only need, need well, the case of Emily Dickinson is something. Uh, and it, she's not the only one. But always there is a sense of belonging. And her poetry, as in many Latin American poets, I think uh, Sor Juana Inés, I think I said Lopez Velarde, Rosario Castellanos, you read their time. Yes, you read their souls, you go into their persons, you go into, you question with them all around, but you do read their time. Mm. You, you have it there so present, uh, even in an encapsulated uh, poet. Mm. I wonder, I think it would be fair in a way to consider that there have been many popular poets that have, or popular writers, the writers that really are in their town since ever, whose stories we still read and enjoy and we recreate them just as Walt Whitman time before when I was a kid, recreating that, those that were done by those that made fables and made stories and made mm -hmm. riddles, we have it. We are the beings with language is not only a way to point at and to think, but it's the, a way of reimagining the world and we need to tell stories. Why do we need to tell stories? Because it gives us a sense of what we are as humans. It's so peculiar. Yes, it's true we all live in this tunnel of time, but we are also 
somewhere else all the time. We, the creators of watches, we are also those that in such a way escape, you know, we escape, we do these things, stories, read back and forth in time, and all that we can do it because we don't need a tunnel of time, we need language. Oh. And we need the, the writer's self that we all have. So here we are in, in this time. I'm going into branches. You ask me one question and then I go. That's, that's always the way it works. <laughs> that's what makes it interesting. Here we are in this time where we, we only communicate through, I mean, mostly through these machines and these screens where we don't have the same kind of relationship with each other and, and with our cities and our communities. I wonder what kind of writing and, and what kinds of art will come out of this time? What, what will be the legacy of 2020? and of the political situation across the world at this time. I also wonder, I really also wonder, and I, something will happen. Something will be a, it's going to be, it's not the anecdote of the pandemic, because we have had pestilence, since, uh, since we know there are so many writers of different times of pestilences. But I don't think any has had this same kind of break. Mm. Uh, why? Because we have the screen, because we have the web, and because something that already was living with us has now become our city, our cities, our city are anomalous, non-geographical, doesn't have corners, mm. has another sense of the city. And I am sure, or of the town, of the family, of the community. And it's going to make a very big uh, change. Personally, I, for me, it's been so difficult to go through as a writer. I'm not going to say as something else. I just miss walking. I need to walk. It's so strange. I need to walk and I need to hear the voices of the people. And I need that sense of me like moving outside. So, uh, messages or friends that tell me this is a moment so wonderful for you you can just be there writing and saying mm. now i feel i'm so i need so much that that sound out now i'm obviously the window is something incredible but i for me the connection is incredibly obvious i need the town the city the outside to get it. It's like I write in a borrowed language. In fact, I don't write in English because that's not my language. My, my, my. But I always, I know now that how much I, I don't know, I think writers are a very different species, but I belong to the species of writers that write with the, the other's words. Yes, I write of things that are very crazy, very my own, very whatever it is, but I need that. And I don't, it's because I'm a 19th century person, no, I mean because I'm a 20th century person, I don't, I don't feel the same vibration. I know there are people who are very easily can read the vibration of the web. In my case, I would say I don't have that training. I don't, I am deaf in many ways. Mm. I try to get it, but I, don't smell it. So it's, uh, it's, it's for me, in another way, I think, oh, I'm so privileged. I don't live in one room with six other people. I don't share the bathroom with the other persons that live in the other parts of the, of the house. I don't, I don't, I'm in a privileged situation. Privileges now are so much noticeable. That's the other thing that this pandemic shows in, in the, the difference of social classes in such a striking and, and, and bold way. 
um, also those that are not even inside the web and are living in a webless world now because that happens too. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I am very, um, I feel I have to reinvent myself as a writer with this. I, 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 it's a very difficult or difficult, it's unfair to say difficult, I repeat, but it's like, a, I am, I'm out of base, exactly, I would say. Uh, by the way, I went with my father when I was a kid also to baseball matches. And I am, I, I am out, I'm out. Something like I'm stepped out. I see younger writers or even not so younger writers that haven't felt so out. But I have this feeling of displacement inside my, myself. And I am so traveler and I'm all the time moving from one place to the other one. But it's not, I need that. And now I have this sense inside of me, my dreams have become so strange. Everything has become so strange. And I re-elaborate, try to re-elaborate, but it's, uh, it's what a moment are we living. What a moment. And then let's not say that we have Trump the cherry of the cake. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave that description of the cherry of the cake. Maybe I'll turn now to, to, to the book of Anna uh, and talk specifically about this book because I, I think you're talking about a, a specific moment in history and, and this book is so clearly placed in, in such a specific moment on, on the eve of, of, of Bloody Sunday and, and Bloody Sunday itself and, and the, the, that time of revolution and change and a lot of what you're saying about this time also seems to me to, to fit that time. You know, I, I have to say, even before I ask you anything, just how much I, I really love this book. It's, it's exciting, it's intriguing, it's emotional. All, all the characters, even in the, the smallest uh, details, seem so real, and yet they, they also kind of make us question what, what is real, and is, is a character more real or less real because she's fictional? Uh, in a way, she's more real. So I, I guess I want to ask you about when, you, when you're working with a historical novel that's also got such sort of broad relevance, what's the connection there to history? Are, are you trying to teach history? Are you trying to move us through history or connect us to history? Well, what's the effort there? Well, first of all, I wanted to pay a debt to Ana Karenina, a worldwide debt. She had written a book, says Tolstoy, and he's the maximum authority. And she still thought it wasn't ready to go to the oven. It wasn't ready to be published, though there's a publisher already there, an editor that wants her book inside the novel of Tolstoy. Um, and then we know that Anna needs uh, her laudano drops to put herself to sleep. We know she's very unhappy. We know she's unsatisfied. We know she lost her Sergei. We know many things of her, but we never know what happened with the damn book. And I, I needed to give her back the book. She, she deserved it. She's a fantastic woman in many ways, and she is condemned to a horrible ending and to a horrible life. Uh, but if she would have published her book, if she would have finished her book, if she would have published it, she would have had a life of her own. She wouldn't have been only the adulteros. She wouldn't have been, she would have been something else, I thought, or I felt when I was rereading Anna Karenina, of course, I didn't remember that she had written a book. It was out. So I wanted to give her back the book. And first I tried to be like more loyal to the plan she originally had. What was she going to do? A book for, for young readers. Um, I tried to, I also, I, I had read, by the way, there's just been a book published on the first earliest versions of Anna Karenina that I haven't read. It just appeared. I mean, I, I, I saw it passing by and I wanted, it's not yet in Kindle 
I don't remember the author in this second, sorry. I'm curious to know, but what I imagined was, um, I wanted to enter like the, like, like how that really that book was and to make also an homage to one of the sparkles that made Anna Karenina possible and it was uh, when Tolstoy met the daughter of Pushkin uh, who was like Pushkin, Pushkin was uh, uh, had had a, a grand grandfather that was African, so they were tainted differently, their hair was different, their body was different, they were something different. Her grand grandfather had been a very important character, uh, the, 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 the Tsar S'mores, somebody calls it or translates it, it was the, the African boy that the Tsar Peter loved, wanted, not that, not not uh, as a as a sentimental partner, but as a, a, a even a colleague and a collaborator and somebody with whom first when he was a kid went to war and many things happened between them. So I thought I'm going to do an homage to Pushkin and I wrote that original novel that I thought she had written in verse, like for her, but it didn't work. And then I did another version, it didn't work, and then it was no longer what I only wanted, but what I imagined. I really needed to give Anna and give a book to be itself. And it was Anna's adult children. But Anna, the truth is, she's a fictional character. So I needed their city, her city, her reality that is painted in the moment that she's alive by Tolstoy. And I realized it was that moment. He, and there I encounter Father Gapon, and then I, the novel started shaping itself, as it always happens. The writer has to work and work and work, but as it always happens, the novel has its own will. The novel is there awaiting for the writer. So I was there like finding it, and suddenly it was there. And honestly, then I had a lot of fun because before in my two previous versions and the work I had done before, I was like struggling and like, oh, I have to be, I have to be a, a, a fair with Anna Karenina. I have to give her back. It's an act of justice. I have to do it. But then suddenly I was doing no act of justice, but I was in that atmosphere, in that world, in what the novel demanded, and I was very much also full of what was going those days in Mexico City. There was something that was in a way a little bit similar. So I was like so rooted in Mexico City those days that I was not writing it here, when I was writing it, I was in New York, but I had been here, I was reading the news. I was totally obsessed. And at the same time, I was totally obsessed by the beginning of the Re Russian Revolution. And I was not doing the, the parallel. I was just like breathing, placing, and the book took its form, its command. And of course, when as a writer, what one has to do is clean, keep the things more or less where they have to be, uh, try to control situations that go out of their way, um, do the general work, the generals, the army work, while all the demons and, and the warriors and all that's happening there was going on. And it was truly, truly so fun. That, that really comes through in the reading. It's so much fun to read. And I, I was thinking as I was reading, you know, we, we often say that the, the artist creates a world, uh, but you've said that artist discovers a world. And I think uh, there's even an argument, I, I think it's in a dream scene in, in the book between Tolstoy and his creations, uh, whether he discovered them or created them. And it, it seems sometimes that we want characters to live on be, beyond a book. Is that something that, that you felt? Do you, do you feel that your characters sort of uh, take on their own life? And, and do they go on when you're finished with them? I honestly 
Sergey is with me, Claudia is with me, that doesn't mean it's with you. Um, but other characters, I feel I more use them. There are some writers that do create the characters very solidly. I have the feeling that, and that also gives me many times a kind of freedom. I have the feeling that my characters are not, yes, obviously they are characters, but they are, they are like, like I, I can't explain it, but I know that my forte is not building like humans, but being the, building these kind of characters, yes, that belong more to the text. I don't know how to explain it, but I know I, I have this sense in, in my person and I quarreled against it during many years. I remember many years ago, a novel I wrote is a woman that is dressed as a man as it happened during the 19th, 17th century, 16th century. And uh, she arrives to Mexico City. They try to kill her. They discover she's a woman and then somebody changes her blood for water. And I remember I wrote it was a kind of uh, um, sleeping beauty in Mexico City in the earlier years of the colonial times. And I remember I, I was fighting against me saying, come on, this cannot happen to a character. Land, this cannot be. But I couldn't avoid it because I knew that the story and the whole plot and the thing, it was there. And I think that character I liked the character, that novel had a lot of readers, people loved her, but I very well know she's not a real character. Mm -hmm. I know she's kind of, let's say, a casualty of the book. Oh. Like the, the plots, it happens also in real life and that's very painful to say, but there are a lot of people that are unable to really take over all their lives and they become like casualties of their time, of or our times. Uh, and Many of my characters, I think most of them, they are casualties of their time. Though some of them think they are not, like Clementine in that novel, she yeah. thinks she is going to change the world and the rest. But in reality, I feel her like she's a casualty of her time. It happens in her time, it happens in, she tries to control her own story. In fact, she takes voluntary acts, but they all of them are done and created and forced by her time. Yeah. So though I very well know at the same time that what I write are not historical novels, but I do visit the time. And I think I kind of see it and understand it. I did it with my novel, Texas, I was there. The novel is there, but at the same time, it is not a historical novel. Why? Because I'm mixing, yes, it's that moment, but I'm mixing uh, things that we don't know who are real and who are not. I know when I will write, I very well know which are I take and I study. Father Dapon became for me an obsession. He looks like fiction. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a historical character, uh, but it was for me, I needed him. Others I only use, like the poor Tsar, he deserves it, by the way, etc. So it's, uh, I think there are writers that are more into doing plot or working on, on, the, on the narrative to say so, and other kind of writers that do more characters. Uh, even writers I, we all admire, let's say Borges, he does, even the plots are kind of secondary because what he wants to do is like a statement that is not philosophical, but it is. And then he makes these incredible plots and the characters, we don't, we, we know they are, or I think Bioy Casares, maybe it's also a Latin American thing. I am not very sure. Bioy Casares, whose characters are, yes, they are there, we know them and the rest, but it's like parts of the plot one knows we are seeing the parts of the plot. And I don't think it is necessarily uh, a default or something when it's just another kind of writer. And I am more in this kind of 
writers than, let's say, a writer I admire, Rosario Castellanos, Mexican. She's very much into doing the characters. Her characters are terrific. It's a different kind. Mm -hmm. And I admire her immensely too. It happens frequently that writers that do this kind of narrative do not know how to admire this other kind of writers. I am lucky. And maybe were those readings of my father when I was a kid. I admire both kinds of writers. I love to admire writers. So let's talk for a minute. I, I am really struck in the novel by uh, this painting. There, there's a painting that has a prominent role in the novel that, that comes from Tolstoy's novel and has its presence in, in your book as well. And I, I found myself thinking that the painting is a portrait and it captures Anna more real than, than she really was. And in a way that seems what the novel can do as well. I wanted to ask you to talk about painting and visual art and, and how that works together or differently from, uh, from your writing. Um, it's an obsession for me, painting, art, but mainly I love painting. Mm. Um, it's an obsession and I always think and remember in former centuries when there was no TV, how they took out a canvas to show it to the people and how the people saw, I mean, they belonged to palaces and whatever it was, but when it was for a minute outside and everybody saw on it the whole story. They not only wanted to see, because now we are more we have more the tendency to put the painting in static and sometimes admire that painting has certain mobility on it or speed or there's movement or whatever, but admire it as if it's something from the static. Uh, I am like those characters that are in the street and suddenly a painting is taken out to do either move it from one palace to the other one or that comes from the artist a atelier from his workshop and he's going to go to the person who's bought it or it's in the church and in the church everybody can see it or it is in a space where people can passers by and I am that one. Mm. I believe in paintings. It, I see on them what's going on. I see on them the plot I'm incredibly fascinated by them. I, I'm even the pentimentos. I mean, I'm just like obsessed by paintings. So also, obviously, when this novel took shape, it needed the painting of Anna Karenina that is described by Tolstoy. And we see how it's done inside the novel. So I, it, it landed on me. It was, it was like kind of what I love and also the novel needed it. It's a, it's a resource. It is in the center of the plot. The novel could not have existed without that painting. We needed that painting, that irritant painting for the son of Anna Karenina. For the son of Anna Karenina is something he doesn't want to see ever. Uh, nor for the rest of the family, it's very disturbing, but for me, I've seen that painting. I know it doesn't exist, I don't care. I care, it exists in, in, in Tolstoy and it exists in my book. And they desire it or not. So I think I, it was something inevitable for me. Thank you, I, I think it exists for me too. <laughs> After having read the book, it, that painting exists and I, I, can, I can see it in my mind's eye. And I, I found myself wishing I could take a trip to the hermitage and, <laughs> and see it, even if it's not there. Maybe uh, we could turn now to, to your teaching. Uh, you, you've taught in, in a lot of different places and, and most recently at, at Macaulay Honors College with our students. Uh, what is it that you've learned ab about your writing and, and about your work from, from working with, with college students? Well, with my Macaulay students, I have a kind of underlined romantic relationship. Because as they are exactly before the pandemia, 
I miss them, that thing that the students give the professor. Uh, and I have remembered, I've returned to some of the authors we studied together, and I have seen how much I learned when I was teaching, reading with them, the authors. So um, I had, I was very lucky, I had incredibly brilliant students. They, every day they are younger, the college students, they are so young, they come from another world. And so they looked at my adored classics, the ones we were studying, the women authors we were studying, with their fresh new eyes, and it enriched my feeling of the of the of the authors. And I, as I say, I have this kind of romantic remembering what is the classroom and the connections and the things they say and how one observes the students. Um, which is a little bit unfair because, and I've been remembering again, ah, and this student said, and the other one said, eh, it would be different if I went into another semester immediately and I knew I could see them and be with them. But that magic of the classroom, the magic of seeing them and acting, it's always like a, a perfect play and they are real characters. You see them all coming from their different worlds. They, they think differently. The world has changed so much. So everything is anew. And I insist, I was very lucky. My students were fantastic. The students I had at Macaulay were super first class. And I have them write the memory is so fresh. So, I defend, I want, I desire we can return to when the pandemic leaves or we are able to defeat the pandemic. We again have that, the magical space of the classroom. It goes way further than just giving a lecture in front of a screen. I'm sorry to say that. I know this is against the rules now because we have to live through the screen. But I know how bigger than that is, how important it is. I, I had heard some other times people telling me, well, it's important for the students, the role model. And I always said, no, no, no. What, import, what is important is what you teach, what you talk about, what they read. But now I think the other way around. And I see them, how important they were for me. And I imagine I was for them. In, a not, in the way that the connection that exists at the classroom and the privilege of the Macaulay students. Thanks uh, for saying that about our students. We think they're all fantastic. Uh, they are fantastic. And, and I think the magic of the classroom is, is something that it's okay to say we miss that. Uh, even, even if we try to recapture through a screen as, as much as we can, it's okay for us to know that, that it's, it's not the same as what it's we have the in the question. We underline it and we have to say it because I think it would be a tragedy that when we can't return to the classroom, several institutions are going to decide the classroom is not necessary or could decide. But I think it's important that we professors say it. It's important it's a space of, a space of thought. Mm. And more than that, you don't think only uh, impersonally, you, you think with the others. And so thinking with the students was something incredible with the Macaulay students. We, uh, we exchanged emails just even earlier today about uh, two courses that, that you're working on or considering for the future. If it won't spoil things, can you tell us a little about those two courses now? Well, the one I am in this second especially particularly um, excited about is the idea of comparing two women writers from two different traditions, two different centuries, both of which decided to make out of confinement the rule of being. One is your Emily Dickinson, and the other one is my Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Uh, 
they are different worlds in many ways, but in another ways, they have so many connections. So many connections because both were women and not because you are marked by being a, we a woman, but because you are marked by the restrictions that the society and the way the, the doors that are open for you, etc. Um, they are from different social classes, but both were able to find in their ways out confinements that protected their work. Um, and there's something even more on how they both formulate the world from their out confinements. Different sorts of out confinements. Emily dressed in white, the color of passion, the color of when the the heat goes to its highest for her. And uh, Sor Juana instead dressed as a nun. Nevertheless, so much obsessed her with describing her person, not describing her person with that dress. So how one is like the dress helps her identity and the other one, how her flesh helps her identity. And the second one is the non. Also, the comparison that is possible between that Catholicism that Sor Juana lived, that was so close to Platonism, and that universe, the religious universe of Emily Dickinson, that is so particular, the one she made for her own, and that has so many connections, not only with Sor Juana, with, with, but with other Spanish-speaking women poets. So I would love to explore that more coherently, order it for the students, leave the adventure with them to immerse, invite a colleague that is an ex, a colleague or colleagues that are experts on Emily Dickinson, and go into that, uh, play with that play, understand our worlds through this uh, connection. That is the course I've been more thinking about because I had thought about the other one before the pandemia. So peculiar how the pandemia also has put a break in everything, but I think it would be nice to also to teach a course about the she boom, the, the generation of the Latin American boom. All the stars were males. It was like a club where males were in. Sometimes they did little concessions to authors that never really had the space to go all the way up, nor had the kind of novels that could uh, be taken by the international market, as was the case with theirs, though those women existed. And though they knew them, and though they had even friendship and connections with, him, with them, so why weren't them there? So I think it's a, uh, uh, it would be good to have a, give a course where we do the shibum, the girls, the women, the extraordinary women authors that should have been in that wave and were not permitted to enter or to be taken by that extraordinary wave and also compared them with the work of the others. Some were very influential for them, very. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they decide, they said it, later in the game say, oh, yes, 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 Elena Gard was so important. I had read her before writing my book, which the connections are so deep and how they were taken away uh, while their literary agent was a woman. So all that is something also that could be fascinating to, to explore. I think our students would have a hard time choosing as, as, as I did when you asked me. So. I think we definitely want to, to find a way to offer both of these courses, maybe not at the same time, so that students could take one than the other. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'd get a great following. In, in a minute or two, I want to turn to questions uh, from, our, from our audience, from our attendees. So please, if you have a question, enter it in the, in the Q&A here on Zoom. Um, and, and before we get to those, let me ask you one, one bonus question. Uh, talk to us about pirates. Sorry, 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 I lost. <laughs> Talk to us about pirates. What is it about <laughs> pirates? Well, I, I wrote a series of novels on pirates when my children were almost babies. They were very small. I was in domestic life, totally in, 
I love that domestic life with them. I had a really happy, ordered, daily domestic life while I was writing these novels full of blood and violence because that was the world of the pirates. In that case, I think, I read, I read myself later, and I think it had begun to be, become for me an obsession to try to understand what happened to that community. The first socialist experience or adventure, utopia made present in the Caribbean Sea that were the brothers of the coast. This is historical. There are documents to show it. I worked on researching about pirates. And then I wanted to know how come that in theory, perfect community where there was no private property, everybody was equal, it didn't matter where you had been born, and no social classes, but women were forbidden. Uh, so how come that absence of women was part of that engine of violence in them? They only had, the, their enemies were the Spaniards that had stolen things from the locals. They said they were their enemies. Is this the, the, the buccaneers that then gave them things to the queen? These were independent. They attacked, they were fierce, they were their enemies, and then all they had uh, taken, all, their, all their, their, their treasures, they just spent them away in prostitutes, in alcohol, in craziness. They didn't want to possess anything. What they wanted was this piracy itself, how it became in them this kind of uh, in way of being. I, I, it was for me an obsession. And then when I was, I wrote one, then I wrote another about also the Brothers of the Coast. And then I thought, well, what about women pirates? So I took the case of these three famous Brit uh, women pirates and I wrote a radio, radio play. But honestly, I, by then I wasn't that excited. It was not for me the same thing. Mm. Uh, it was interesting to try another form. The radio play it aired, it happened. It was interesting, but it didn't have for me the emotional adventure that was to what was this world where women were forbidden? Uh, I needed that. I needed to have that kind of thinking that is a novel. Because when you write a novel or I write a novel, I, I am making myself lots of questions and trying to find answers. But it's like a perpetual question, 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 question. So exploring. So I did that exploration. Um, I don't know how I could manage it. I would be completely unable to manage that levels of violence, blood, attacks. Mm. But I could, I was, I could do it. Another thing that I think that permitted or wouldn't permit me today to do it is what had happened in Mexico in the last 15, 20 years. The violence, the, the so I have become like more, uh, I have I have another relationship with violence. I couldn't do it now, but I did it. Thank you. But That's. Uh... I, also, I also had fun. I also had fun. Had a lot of fun. I I always read these stories or hear to colleagues that say, "Oh, writing is so much suffering." Yes, there is something there in my back, in my neck, in the hours I'm. There, now I can no longer write in the bed. That's my favorite place because my back can stand it, my neck can stand it. That's for me the source of pain. Writing itself is, even if I am writing something terrible, there's always an immense joy. Well, let's see if we have uh, some questions from the, from the audience at this point. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to do this on Zoom or maybe my uh, let's see. colleagues can pass them on to me. A ver, here we are. Let's see, here's one right at the top from Mary Pearl, our, our dean at Macaulay. Uh, she says, do your characters sometimes surprise you? And what was your relationship to Tolstoy's and your own characters? How did the relationship differ? 
There, a, a very beautiful question. Thanks, Mary. Uh, very different relationships. In when I was when I am reading a novel, I see them as a done deal. And yes, surprise is not the ingredient. It's always they do what they are doing. And that I can admire, love them, hate them, whatever it is. With my characters, I always have first a double feeling. I have never had till now a character that while I'm writing, I just love. I always have this thing, ambivalence, to say so. And they very frequently surprise me. Very frequently. Even the case of Clementine that appears in this novel, I I didn't make her. She appeared in my life and everything, how she dressed, what she did, where she came from, everything for me was a complete surprise. Oh. Others uh, are like less uh, surprising in a way, but they always come like even with their breath. I can smell them. I can, I know if they have a good smell or not. There's something even like corporal with them that is a uh, very surprising and very nice. We have a question now from, uh, from Professor Reese, uh, uh, another Macaulay faculty member. Uh, Lizzie asks, uh, you imagine, or she imagines, I'm sorry, that you have many students who also consider themselves writers or, or they would want to try after you inspire them, what advice would you give to a, to a college student who wanted to follow in your footsteps? My first and only advice I can give is read, A, B, correct. One thinks one writes and it's there. If you think that there's something wrong, there's, you have to be always like Stop being enamored of that. Correct, correct, correct. Throw out, throw out, throw out. And I always tell them when they ask me the, 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 the fact that when somebody that doesn't read a lot, that doesn't correct, only writes commonplaces, things that have already been said and said a hundred million times. So the only way to find your own you, I tell them, is correct write others, learn how to admire other writers. Read, 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 and not that, don't admire yourself. Be your own enemy. Mm. All right, don't feel bad. I mean, I have finished several times novels and I tell them and they then don't publish them, throw them, redo them like this one. I had one complete neat, I had even sent it to my agent, the, not the book. And then I said, no, 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 this is a disaster. I saw it. And luckily the agent too. But I saw it. I then realized, I said, no, what? this doesn't work. So that is super important. That's what I tell them. You know, when we first started talking about you teaching at Macaulay, uh, one of the things you told me was, I don't want to teach a writing workshop where people bring in their work and I criticize it. I do not want to do that. Uh, why did you say that then? Uh, several reasons. Reason number one, uh, in English, I wouldn't do it. I don't have that level of English. Hmm. Reason number two, I did it once and it was very uncomfortable with me. I felt I always needed something else was there. Reason number two, I do think that a young writer mainly needs to learn other things first before I I not not the workshop is my 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 position might be madness but I think that a writer a writer to be writer needs to learn biology learn about painting learn history learn mathematics learn read literature and learn how to be its own enemy. And I think that what could happen in a workshop is that then you will take the place of the enemy. And I don't know how the voice of a writer grows the same. This is totally incorrect. I do very wrong saying it aloud, but that's what my lungs, my, I gave you the whole explanation. 
and I, I, I feel like un uncomfortable. I've done it sometimes, but I don't feel my soul doesn't go there. While for me it's a treasure when I see in a classroom that one or two of the students want to be writers. And then I insist on reading, see this, see how this works on others. Because that way I think they strengthen their muscle as critics. And then they have to be critics of themselves. But um, reading classics, reading great authors that, <gasps> while I think that reading also other young authors to be writers, I don't know, I might be totally wrong. Uh, it, it, I know it's all over the world. The Americans started it now in Mexico. It's also a big thing. And I always, I, I, I feel this, but maybe it's only because I'm a 19th century person. So we have a question about you as a, as a reader. Um, are there any books on, on your summer reading list? And do you have a particular kind of book that you like to read during the summer? Um, as I have um, given some lectures uh, to a festival, first I did one for a festival, uh, then I did another one for an event of writers, then I gave another one here, UNAM and San Ildefonso. Uh, and I've been reading, like when I'm working on a novel, which I'm not, reading only the things that I need to reread or to, to work on, to think on. And I don't have enough time, unluckily, to read all I would like to read. Now I think, besides, I'm, as I said, I'm obsessed again by Emily Dickinson and Sor Juan, and I've been both digging into their works, digging on reading on a biography of this, the other biography, reading the Octavio Paz. But I am not doing a real reading, reading, but I'm doing a selfish reading on the things that I am working on. Uh, in a week or two weeks, I'm going to have a conversation with Salman Rushdie about his key shot that he published that I read months ago. Yeah. I have it right in front of me because I have to have it fresh and I have to have the, the questions and the whole thing uh, with me. So I'll have to do that reading. Uh, but I haven't and the other day I was telling myself, why don't you give you the pleasure of just reading a novel for the sake of reading a novel? But then my brother gave me a book, sent me a book as a gift, uh, Salomón de las Selvas, a Nicaraguan author, uh, which I have a complicated relationship with him, admire a lot of his work, detest his life. Mm -hmm. and irresistible and I know as and again I'm going to read it's not a novel first and uh, I'm going to read it again just like with my pick like what do I take out of here so I haven't given myself this thing mm. unluckily unluckily uh, we have a question now from uh, from Jaden Marshall who worked with me uh, I guess last fall uh, hi, Jaden. You talk, you, she asks, you talked about how Anna struggled uh, to let go of her book and let it go out into the world. Is this something that you struggle with? How, how do you know when you're ready to send one of your stories out into the world? A super good question, too. I normally, years ago, I always gave my books to three friends I trusted. Um, the three of them are passed, passed away already. So, I lost that resource that helped me from one terrible mistake, a novel that shouldn't have been, and I thought I could publish it. But with the years, what I have learned is that it, it's a little bit painful for me to let go a book. Mm -hmm. So the one that's coming out that was supposed to come out in June and will come out in, in September 8th, um, I had it in my drawer like two years before letting it go. I wasn't totally sure. And then I read it and I loved it. And again, I read it and I loved it. Sorry to say it, it's wrong that I say that, but I could not let it go. 
And now that uh, I have to work on the airing it with the years, I didn't have this before, but now I do have a little bit of pain when the book is not my secret. Um, yes, a little bit of pain. Yeah. It's very difficult. Not that I feel anxious of what the critics are going to say about it. It's only something selfish, something I don't know if selfish is the word. Another thing, also during many years, I never published the novel till I had the next one about to be ready. I always had that cushion and I haven't been able. So this one was not yet ready to be given to the publisher when I gave my book of Anna away. And now this one, I just, it's just going to appear. I still don't, I have tried several, but I haven't been in a mood of writing a novel and now less. So it's a bit like I don't have my, my, my secret. When I wrote, finished writing my first, first novel, it took me seven years to give to the publisher hmm. my first book, but I already had the second one. And the second one, I gave it away because I gave an interview of the first one. I already almost had ready a third. And Octavio Paz, that was listening to it in the TV was, asked at his publishing house if I could give them that book to read. And I gave it and he published. Uh, but it was more like this thing. Um, and in fact, I published the very first one because I needed money. And it was also of the past. I already, it was two years, many years behind and I was already in another thing. So I do have a strange relationship with the books and also when they arrive, I try to make a celebration, but I always feel there's a betrayal. Oh. No longer mine. Mm -hmm. I have this thing very peculiar and it won't ever be mine again because um, it's out. It's it's going to be. I don't know how to explain that. I I'm, think I, I'm I, hearing I, echoes of, of having a child, and and when the child leaves and goes into the world, it's, it's a similar mm -hmm. feeling. Um, our, our next question is from Cameron Stewart, a, a writer himself, who says, uh, when when writing a his a historical novel, do you ever give yourself permission to to break from the factual details in the service of the book's own needs? As a very good question, Cameron, also, thanks. Um, as I always use like the a scenario, like the, like the place, it gives me space to a lot of action. Um, I don't think I have voluntarily made ever uh, uh, twisted something voluntarily. Though evidently because it's like, uh, like the place where things happen. So I don't do, I don't really do, I don't do historical novels. I do, I do novels and sometimes they have this historical frame. Uh, so in theory, I would have more freedom, but why do, why do you use that space, that frame, if you are not going to be there? So I don't know. It could be, it happened to me with my novel, Texas, that I remember I went to launch it to the city of Monterrey, Mexico, North Mexico, and it was, uh, there were many historians in the audience and they were furious at me because they hated the story I told. They hated it and they thought I was totally wrong and I know I was right. So that is another thing. History is always a battleground and I have my side and I think I'm not, betraying my side. I'm doing the thing that it's there that I have to do. Somebody might think I made a mistake with the case of Texas. I did not make the mistake. They had another take, another interpretation <laughs> of the story. They were all male in the audience. There was not even one woman. And I felt like they were, we were three women talking about the book and I felt they all were like, they're ready to it's okay, it's good. That's why books are for two. Was it wonderful? No, I felt very uncomfortable. Some people love to have these discussions and battles, 
I don't. Hmm. Uh, Maria Jose, Maria uh, asks if you've ever encountered a reaction from the public that you didn't expect. Maybe this is Texas is one example. Has the public ever taken any part of your writing for something different? Uh, and how has that affected you? Oh, wonderful question, Maria Jose. Thanks for it. Yes, of course. They, you know, there's been so much written about my novels is bad that I say it. It sounds like arrogant but it's a fact uh, and then sometimes I read and I say no but what can I do that's what it is that's what's a book reactions yes I said the reaction of Texas in decide in the city of North Mexico but also for me was a surprise that in the state of Texas they liked it I couldn't believe it. I talk so bad about you gringos, the gringos, and the Texans, and I, it, it's a novel that it really doesn't like them. And they loved it. And that was for me a surprise when the, the, the publisher said, I want the novel. I said, don't do yourself that. Don't do yourself that. He said, no, 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 it's going to work. It's going to work. And in fact, he was right. They, they, I had it's a very literary book. I know the kind of limited audience a literary book has, but it was a surprise. It sold much more and had much more. Uh, the audiences were great whenever I uh, talked about the book in the Texan world and the reaction was fantastic. So it was also a surprise, but it's always a kind of, uh, you never know. You really never know. And maybe that's why I, I don't know, but I think it's also a thing that I don't have another book here to protect me, mine, before publishing the one I have there. Stanley Fu asks about, uh, he, he's reminded of an, another book by Norman Spinrad, The Iron Dream, which uh, tells a fantasy tale written by Adolf Hitler. And oh. he, he asks, what is the idea? Uh, what, what, it, what do you get from writing a book purportedly written by another person? He'd like to learn more about that approach. Well, I, I don't know this book. I am going to look, I'm looking forward, I'm tempted. Um, I have done it many times. I did it even with Cervantes, the author of El Quixote, whom I adore. And he has a, one of his short novel, novellas is about a gypsy girl, La Gitanilla. He says, La Gitanilla no, is not a gypsy. Um, and I did, a, I did a total retake and I retold his story totally, mm. meaning I gave another version. I gave another life to her, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his character, completely different. I read it differently and I read it as I think it should have been. Uh, how did I dare? And then not only that, I used him. I put him as a character inside the novel. La Otra Mano de Lepanto is the novel, very long. It's never been translated into English. Mm. And I did it as a sense of reading him and doing what uh, Maria Jose Larrea asked us, giving another take totally different of his book. In this case, it's not that I didn't read in his book what he said. I really know what he said and I didn't like it. So I did it totally different. He's living in the moment that the Moors are being expelled from Spain. And he writes this novella where he justifies this racist uh, attitude. And yeah. then I did, but I love him. He's a great author. So I used him also as a character and I went all the way to Battle of Lepanto and I placed it all on his time and I made it more real than his own novel. We have a, a final question that, that uh, comes from our Vice President of External Relations, and it actually is, is one that was on my list, too, that I didn't get to ask you. Uh, and it, it has to do, you, you mentioned a, a book that's never been translated into English. What's it like working with translators? Do you have an active collaboration? Is there, is there back and forth? Are there ever things that just don't come out right in translation that, as, as you judge it? Uh, I do. I do work with the translators, uh, not so much as they would like. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I have learned with the years to be respectful uh, and to know how to admire the work of a translator because translators are writers themselves. And I have, I, the last works I have worked with has have been with one wonderful translator, uh, Samantha Schne, who translated the book we are talking about today. And uh, we have become friends and we talk about it and I let her do. And then if I see something that doesn't, then I say, um, I did it in French also with Claude Fell uh, intensely. Um, German, I very almost know German in my thing, but the questions of the translators were very, and I responded thoroughly to all of them. Um, in Italian, I have this wonderful person that I could never correct anything from her because she's fantastic, Marta Canfield. So, and Pino Canucci. Uh, so I, it's a, it's a, a, a life one has with them. Um, and I've learned how to live it with, with pleasure. It's not easy. It's not yeah. easy. And I think it's easier if you know nothing about the language because then you just walk out. But it's, uh, and, and, but now I, I admire them. It's being a writer. Mm. And I have difficulties to get the level, get the tone. How do you do it? How do you write? So I admire, I think I've learned to be respectful and I, but I really don't know if they think I'm that. Uh, I'm sure they do, and I, I really appreciate the time that you, you took with us today. I think we had a, a great conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure our attendees did, too. I'll, I'll hold up the book one more time. It seems to be showing a mirror image, but uh, you'll figure it out. The Book of Anna, uh, available from Coffee House Press, coffeehousepress.org. And I'm sure that when we're all back in, in the building and able to get together again, uh, I'm going to ask you, Carmen, to sign my copy, and I'm sure you, you'll be happy to do that, I hope. I'll do it with pleasure. Thank you very much. I didn't thank Jeff Gleek, who invited me to be here. Thanks, Mary, for attending. Thanks, you all who were here, that I don't see you. Um, and, Joe, thanks again. It's our second conversation in a screen, <laughs> kind of. Um, so thank you so much. It's happy to be uh, even in this way with you all. Thanks again, and goodbye, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.